Amen. Welcome, welcome to all, to all of those who are uh, following this live. And for those who will be watching later, we are so glad that uh, you can be with us in that sense and uh, join into this time of worship and, and digging into God's word. And I, I want to I wanna encourage you, I want to challenge you to... Um, to make sure that you really engage in this time. Don't don't just monitor a message and, and listen in to worship as it happens, but engage yourself. Uh, I know for most of you, this is gonna be an, uh, a different experience as you worship in front of a screen or as a group in your living room. And yet, worship is something that we can do any place and any time. And so I encourage you, engage, lock in, and really give yourself to this time, knowing, expecting that the Lord is going to meet you in the midst of it, that, that you will experience his presence with you as you worship him, and that you'll hear his voice as we look to his word. So, well, let, let's, let's get going with that. Um, this morning we are going to be in Luke chapter 7, and it's there in Luke chapter 7 as we look at John the Baptist and what, what's going on with him at this juncture uh, that we really are reminded of the fact that at one time or another, all of us have found ourselves in the place where we, f well, we feel disappointed with God. Oh, maybe we've we've prayed for God to do something good and then God didn't do it. Or we've experienced something bad and God didn't shield us from it. Maybe we've been in a situation where we have just cried out in, in, in desperation to God. And his answer to us has been no. But it, it felt like he didn't answer us. It, it felt like we were alone. And so we end up being confused because we thought that we knew what it was that God would do, but he didn't do what we thought that he would do. We can become disheartened. You know, we, we see an issue as, as something good versus something evil, and, and God doesn't do the, the thing that we think is good, the thing that we want him to do. So we get discouraged. You know what you do in that moment is so important. What you do with that situation is so vital. Some people are prone to, to get mad, to get mad at God, to, to lock down on their own perspective on this situation, whatever it is, or to become overwhelmed with their feelings of disappointment or abandonment. And in the end, some of them will shipwreck their faiths. Not because of what they might call God's unfaithfulness or capriciousness, because he, he isn't either of those things. But really because of their own unwillingness to accept that what they might be thinking about things, well, it isn't right thinking that their perspective on what's going on, then it might just be skewed. You know, when we adopt that mindset, and we all do that, we somehow become blind to, to the arrogance of thinking that, that we would know better than God, that, that we're fit to judge what God does and to tell him when he's wrong. It's, it's really preposterous, isn't it? And yet, we all do it at times. I think we need to realize we do it to our own harm. You and I, we're not the first ones to, to struggle with this. It's not just a modern problem, and it's not just something that, that spiritual lightweights deal with. In fact, I would argue that the more you put your faith and trust in God, the more likely you are at some point to be disappointed or confused by how things turn out. Even John the Baptist, a man of, of great faith, of 
immeasurable boldness, of, of earnest commitment to being God's man. Even he struggled with this. Let's take a look at that. I encourage you, grab your Bibles, okay? Open them up to Luke chapter 7, find verse 18. We're going to read uh, from verse 18 through verse 28. And um, I encourage you to follow along. So Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 18. Here's what Luke writes. Then John's disciples told him about all these things. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord, asking, Are you the one to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men reached him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, Are you the one to come, or should we expect someone else? At that time, Jesus healed many people of diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits. And he granted sight to many blind people. He replied to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, and those with leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. After John's messengers left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who are splendidly dressed and live in luxury are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. But the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Let's pray again. Father, we pray that you would take your word and you'd speak it to our hearts. God, that, that you would help us to understand and to hear your voice in the midst of this time. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us what we need to hear from you. God, I pray for each and every one of us this morning. God, that despite the fact that we are dispersed around our community, that you are with us and that we are encountering you this morning. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. and We pray that you'd speak to us and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you remember over the last several chapters as we have been uh, going through Luke's gospel, we've read about Jesus teaching the crowds about the kingdom of God. And he's called disciples to come and to follow after him. And he's been healing the sick and freeing the oppressed from demons. He, he's even been healing lepers and he's raised the dead. Jesus has been showing himself to be God in human flesh, the, the long-promised Messiah. And so it's no surprise in verse 18 that we read that John's disciples told John about all these things. They were amazing things. Of course, they would be telling John about them, but you have to ask this question. Why are they having to tell John? Why isn't John seeing this for himself? Well, it's this. John has been arrested by Herod Antipas and has been placed in prison. Josephus, the historian, tells us that John was accused of sedition, of inciting revolution, and therefore he was imprisoned and eventually executed by Herod there at his fortress palace of Machaerus. So there is John cut off from the outside world. 
and he hears from his disciples about all that Jesus is doing, all that is happening uh, by that is being done by the one that he has pointed them to as the Lamb of God. But rather than being encouraged, it seems that hearing these things are happening, it stirs a questioning within John. Look there, partway through verse 18. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord. And here's the question he sends them to ask. Are you the one who is to come? Or should we be expecting someone else? That should strike you as odd. Remember, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, John had been quite bold, quite certain in declaring Jesus to be the Messiah. John understood that, that he himself was the forerunner of the Messiah, the one that, that God had spoken about through the Old Testament prophet Malachi. There in Malachi chapter 3, in verse 1, we read this. God says, Behold, I send my messenger. And he will prepare. That was John. His job was to point others to Jesus. And he did. That's what he did. As we read in John chapter 1, there in verse 29, it says that John saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said to his disciples, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John had pointed to Jesus, saying things like he does in, in, in cha chapter 1, verse 27 of John's gospel. It, John knew, he knew what this was all about. He said, he is the one who is coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. You see, John knew. He knew what mattered was Jesus, not him. That he was a signpost. And Jesus was the one they needed to see. But now here we are in chapter 7, and things haven't turned out the way that John thought that they would turn out. And so now we find John here questioning his past confidence and, and asking, was I wrong? Are you the Messiah? Or should we be looking for someone else? So what happened? How did John lose his certainty? He had been faithfully doing his job, calling God's people to repentance, warning them of the judgment of God that was going to come, preparing the way for Jesus, the Messiah, to step in. It's a hard job. Though the, the common people were responding well to him, yet the religious leaders, they not only rejected him, it seemed they hated him. And then there was Herod Antipas. Herod liked to listen to John. But when John confronted him about his sin, he had John arrested and eventually beheaded. So now here is John sitting in jail. His ministry has been stopped. I think it's quite likely that John was discouraged, was disheartened, disappointed with what God was doing. He didn't understand. From his perspective, things were a mess. They, they weren't going well. They certainly weren't going the way that John assumed that they would. You know, what, what different people of that era expected to happen when the Messiah came, it varied from person to person. Some expected liberation. Uh, they expected uh, the Messiah to overthrow the, the, the Roman occupiers. Others expected uh, some sort of apocalyptic God intervening vengeance upon Israel's enemies uh, with all the Gentiles being wiped out by some angelic army. A few were looking for some sort of a spiritual move amongst God's people, uh, bringing integrity and power back to the temple worship. John seemed to expect Jesus to come and to immediately destroy all evil and to judge those who were unrighteous. Matthew tells us that 
John often spoke of God's coming wrath, of the Messiah bringing a, a final judgment, which by the way, he will. But Jesus came that first time preaching forgiveness. And John sat in prison. That had to have confused John. I'm sure it frustrated him. Here was Jesus doing many of the things that the Messiah was supposed to do. But he hadn't taken over. He hadn't overthrown the Romans. He hadn't restored purity at the temple and thrown out the, the false high priest. Nor had he judged the wicked or freed the righteous prisoners like John. We might phrase John's question like this. Jesus, why aren't you doing the things that I thought you would do? Have you asked that? I know I have. There have been so many times when I've prayed the Lord to act, to intervene, to do something that, that just had to be a good thing. And so God had to do it. And yet he didn't. In the midst of this, we're reminded of the fact that Jesus was doing many very good and amazing things. Look at verse 21. At that time, Jesus healed many of diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits. And he granted sight to many blind people. And he replied to John's disciples, go and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are told the good news. And so he says, blessed is the one who isn't offended. You know, the prophet Isaiah had written much about what the Messiah would do when he came. In Isaiah chapter 61 there in verses 1 and 2, a passage which, by the way, Jesus, if you remember, read at the beginning of his ministry when he was there in Nazareth. There Isaiah writes, The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn. In Isaiah chapter 29, Isaiah wrote this, On that day the deaf will hear the words of a document, and out of a deep darkness the eyes of the blind will see. The humble will have joy after joy in the Lord, and the poor people will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Jesus had been doing many of those things. Think of just the last few chapters in the Gospel of Luke. Just as Isaiah had foretold the blind, the lame, and the deaf, were being healed. The dead were being raised. The poor were being given the good news. And so Jesus answers John's question. He tells John's disciples, go back. Tell John what you've seen, what you hear. Tell John what I'm doing, that I'm fulfilling the words of Isaiah. Tell John, yes, I'm the Messiah. I am the the one. I want you to notice something here. Something that I think is so interesting, especially in the Gospel of Luke, we see that much of Jesus' ministry was toward those who were outcasts. They were the rejected ones, the outsiders. Those who were considered unclean. Oh, those who were sick and broken and in need those who were sinners considered to be on the outside. Some of you might relate to that. You might feel like an outsider when it comes to church. I want you to know this. 
You are Jesus' kind of people. He's for you. And he's calling you. He welcomes you in. And he invites you to turn to follow him. Well, Jesus was doing many, many good things. But there were some things that Isaiah spoke of that Jesus didn't do. At least not that first time that he came. I think that's why he tells John, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. He's saying, John, here's what I'm doing, but I'm not doing these other things yet. And if you can hang on, if you can understand this, you'll be blessed. You see, Jesus is coming again. He came the first time and he will come a second time. Hebrews chapter 9 talks about this. There in verse 28, the writer of Hebrews says this, Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to bear sin. He came the first time to bear sin. But now he will come a second time to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. In other words, the first time Jesus came as the humble servant to die on the cross to pay the price for my sin and for yours. But he's coming back. He's coming back a, a second time. And he's coming back the second time as a victorious king. And then, then he will complete the tasks that Isaiah foretold and that John was looking for. Then he will bring judgment against all sin. He will set the righteous captives free and he will set every wrong to rights. That day will come, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and the angels with him and he will sit on his glorious throne. That day has not yet come. It had not come in, in, in John's day and it has not come yet in our day. But let me tell you this, it's coming soon. It is coming. That day will come when Jesus will come in his glory with all the angels. That being the case, that Jesus had not come in glory, that Jesus had not set to right all those things that were wrong. How was John and how were Jesus' other followers supposed to respond to these things? Things that, that honestly at that point I don't think they really understood. What was John supposed to think about his own story? The fact that his ministry was cut off. He had been faithful. He'd done what God had called him to do, and yet here he is, stuck in prison. You know, Luke doesn't directly address this question here, and yet he does give us a hint to the answer by simply recounting for us what it is that Jesus says next. Uh, look at verse 24. After John's messengers left, he, that is Jesus, began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? So Jesus asked the crowd, and remember these crowds, many of them, they had gone out to hear John preach long before they began to follow Jesus. In fact, many of them were probably following Jesus because they'd been there with John when John pointed to Jesus. And told them, this is the Messiah, this is the one to follow. So Jesus asks them, why did you go out to hear John? Was it just to see the scenery? No, that wasn't it. Look at verse 25. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? No. He says, see those who are splendidly dressed, live in luxury and are in royal palaces. And John was far from that. John wore camel skin and leather. He was rough and rugged. Though it is a little bit ironic because John was at that very moment in a palace. Okay, yes, he was in the dungeon prison of a palace, but he was there with Herod at the palace of uh, Macarius. 
Jesus continues, what then did you go out to see? A prophet? And Jesus says this, yes, that's it. A prophet. He says, I tell you, more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. You see, John was a prophet. They went out to see and to hear John because God was speaking through him. And John was more than just a prophet. He was the Messiah's forerunner. And because of that, verse 28 tells us, I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. You see, John held a position of immense honor and dignity. Even though John was wearing his coarse clothing and eating his odd diet, this rough man of the wilderness, and yet he is a man that God chose to, to pour such honor and dignity upon him. No other human being got to do for Jesus what John got to do. John not only pointed people to Jesus at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, but don't forget this. John was the one who baptized Jesus. No one had a greater honor than that. Look again at verse 28, though. No one is greater than John, Jesus says, but, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Any and every follower of Jesus Every last saved sinner who submits to Jesus will receive an even higher honor than that which John had. You see, John baptized Jesus. He pointed people to Jesus. But you and I, well, Jesus died for us. And he indwells us. He lives within us. Now, here's how this helps us when we find ourselves feeling disappointed with God, discouraged by, by what God hasn't done or confused about what God has allowed to happen. There are a couple things that we can remember. First, like John, we've got to remember whose show this is. John's job was to point to Jesus and not to build a glorious ministry. John's purpose wasn't to, to live a free and happy man. John's purpose was to point to Jesus. You and I, we've got to remember that we are supporting actors in the drama of life that stars Jesus. The story is about Jesus, not about us. Our story is about Jesus and not about us. You see, at the end of the movie, at the end of the show, it isn't you or me who will stand in the spotlight. It will be Jesus. And things end up when they end up right, not for our glory, but for his. He's the Savior. He gave his life to redeem us. He purchased us out of sin. He took our sin upon himself and gave us his righteousness. And so he and he alone is worthy of deserving any and all glory. We've got to remember that it's about him and not about us. Secondly, we've got to remember that this life isn't the end of the story. Jesus came once, but he is not done. He's coming again. He has not yet brought justice. He hasn't yet destroyed all evil. That hasn't happened yet, but it will. It will happen. And even if you or I, if we die first, remember death is not even our end. It is nothing more than a transition from this life into eternity. If we don't see Christ's justice in this life, we will see it. 
will see it in eternity. The day will come, and that day is getting closer and closer. When every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So what you do when you find yourself confused, even disappointed with God and with what he's done or left undone, it's so vital that you remember that this is his story. Your situation may not make sense if you view yourself as the main character. But I promise you this, when you put God at the center of your story, the end makes sense. And secondly, when you remember that even when we're done here, we're not done. We have all of eternity ahead of us. Oh, sure. There will be much that here in this life will remain broken. But it will be fixed there. It will be set right there. Because Jesus isn't done yet. There are wrongs that haven't been righted, but they will be. There's justice that has not yet been brought about, but it will. So keep your eyes on Christ. Look for and long for that day because it's getting closer. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you that you, you show us John's struggles, God, because we can relate to that. And Father, this morning, I pray especially for those who today find themselves struggling because you haven't done what they thought you would do. Things haven't worked out the way that they had hoped and prayed that they would. I pray that you would comfort their hearts, that you would minister to them, and that God, in the midst of their disappointment, in the midst of their confusion, would you remind them that they are a part of a much grander story. And that if they will be faithful to point to you, come what will, that they will play their part well. Will you remind us, Lord, that this life isn't the end? That we aren't living just for the sake of that which takes place from from our birth to our death, but we are living in light of the reality that we will be with you for all of eternity. God, help our thinking to maintain that proper context. And Father, I pray that you'd encourage us, you'd strengthen us, you'd bind us together. And God, even in this, this season where we are, we are dispersed abroad, you'd connect us. God, that we would be praying for each other, reaching out to each other, ministering to each other, encouraging and challenging each other. God, may your church emerge from this season stronger, more vital, more active than it has been in a long, long time. Work in us, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.